and we are in the most isolated spot in the trade show plaza C and we have a lot of wonderful resources that aren't being picked up by people who may have a lot of interest and concern about hepatitis C in your communities so I just wanted to let you know we have some good things to pass out and we'd really like it if you came to visit us thanks very much Good afternoon. Thank you everybody for uh, coming to join us today. I know it's starting to become another part of the long day as we get excited in the morning, get fed, and then start uh, thinking as all these incredible presentations happen throughout the day. So really appreciate uh, you coming to our session and, uh, and hearing about our Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health that we're proposing to UBC. But before we get started any further, what I'd like to do is introduce someone that has been absolutely integral to the proposal and a guiding light for our team at UBC, uh, Chief Wayne Christian. And he's going to come up and do an opening prayer for us, and then we'll get started. Thank you. I am Chief Wayne Christian, and I've been asked to uh, which is pray in our language to open this session, and uh, uh, I've just been learning my language and, you know, the residential school and all that stuff, and I was involved in the 60s scoop. Uh, so I'm just actually learning to uh, speak uh, so I'd like to uh, offer this prayer for the work that uh, you're all going to be doing here. Uh, not only here, but uh, throughout all the, uh, the meeting rooms that are happening. And, uh, and after I do that, I have to leave because next door they're talking about the social determinants of health, and uh, it really is of interest to me. So I just want to uh, begin with the prayer. So, well, Kukbi, Katma Kosma Kakatin, Kukstako, no Kukbi, Kukstako Tamisku, you come into Hawaii, Testament Elliot Tamih, you come into Rock Kalmuch. Spiria, Sarka, Elra Titlinku, Kanukunku, your yard ku, Kuksako to cook me, or quiet as them, or quiet as rent assault in all my relations. So thank you very much, Kuksha. All right, so if we can have the presentation up. I, what I plan to do this afternoon is give you just a brief overview of what's been uh, a lot of work over the last couple of years with a wide multidisciplinary group of people who have been interested in actually helping UBC develop a Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that means, what our main focus is gonna be, but really, as we're going through this, I encourage you to jot down some questions, some comments, some ideas, because we're hoping that we're gonna have some time here to really get your input, because this is a proposal. In fact, we have a date that we will be presenting this at UBC to the Senate on November 20th, at which point the, we will know whether we're going forward with this further. I also, this is a process at a university I think it's important that you know that it's already gone through the policy committee and was passed unanimously. I think it's important for you to know that we have had uh, tremendous support from the administration of UBC who have acknowledged uh, the need for this. Uh, and that one of our team, member, team members sends his regrets that he could not make it, and that's uh, Dr. Link Kessler, who has been involved with the First Nations House of Learning as the leader there and is the special advisor to the president on indigenous affairs at UBC. So we've really, uh, although it's up, me up here speaking, I cannot stress enough the amount of uh, input that has gone into this and the huge team that we have that have put a lot of uh, heart and soul into the project. So, let's see here. Next slide, please. There we go. So basically, 
UBC Center for Excellence is located in, in the multi, it's for, across the health disciplines. So at first we thought what we were gonna do is create this center, this idea for the Faculty of Medicine, which is the largest faculty at UBC and certainly encompasses a lot of the health disciplines. As an indication of the support, what happened was it was recognized that there are a lot of health disciplines that are not in the Faculty of Medicine. We started to get into the details about how a university as large as UBC is and, and how it is organized, but it became evident that the benefit of this uh, center could be reached to all the other health disciplines that aren't in the faculty, including things like nursing or dentistry or pharmacy, and, and the list goes on. There are three critical areas where we are focusing. Sometimes we call them pillars, but this is sort of how we wrap our head around it when we're looking at ways to organize things and focus. One is research, one is curriculum or education, we call it, and the other is students. But overwhelmingly, the importance of this is really the partnerships between uh, the, the faculties and the students and the professors and the administration of the university but much more importantly, of course, is who this is for, and so partnerships with communities and community organizations. So when we're looking at the concept of research, for the most part, we, could, we have handouts to give you for all these slides. We really, with the time, limited time that we have, I'm not gonna go through each of these points, except to make sure that you, encourage you to take home one of these uh, handouts that have these slides verbatim, and then you can go through it. But to give you some of the highlights, Research is such an important part of how we are gonna move forward with either, we've heard about it a lot with the First Nations Health Authority, but certainly with our health concerns. And it's important that the research be driven by communities with their priorities, with their ideas, and what our center is hoping to do is simply be that unifying place where if questions arise and a community wants to undergo research and they need some assistance or want to partner, that we can be that focal point at the university where they can contact and we can hook you up with people who have similar interests, perhaps expertise or experience in an area, and partnerships can be formulated when research projects arise at the community level. And that's a really key point. Um, overall, the, uh, the other thing is basically collaboration within the university is important because what we found and what community members have repetitively said when we've asked them is that it's sometimes frustrating because there's all these different projects going around and sometimes they're very similar and there's, it, it seems like why can't researchers get their act together and actually not keep coming to our communities when someone just asked us about this concept of a diabetic research study or suicide or cancer or, or issue X, Y, or Z. So how do we create that level of collaboration within the university? I think it's important that we, the one thing that we want to uh, avoid certainly in, in research is that concept of what we used to call parachuting. A and communities have said that, you know, that they feel that researchers come in and they parachute into a community and then they leave and don't ever return the results. This is gonna be a place where we can make sure that that is a fundamental thing that we address because of the partnerships. Education or curriculum is certainly being uh, at the university a key point. Uh, a lot of the issues with respect to what's going to be involved have been brought up already and brought up as major concerns by the First Nations Health Authority themselves and that's stuff like cultural safety, cultural competency. It's involving uh, curriculum development that's currently going on in a very active way at the Faculty of Medicine. But universities are a dynamic field and essentially as soon as a curriculum is developed, there's always room for change, room for improvement, and hopefully this center will not only be a focal point where we can get input in from the indigenous perspective, but also a point where people can come when they have concerns about curriculum or ideas about how to improve it, and we can help facilitate that with the people who are experts uh, in that area, community members that come in with these ideas. Oh, sorry about that. Then the other one is students. And really, in, in a way, we should almost reverse the slide order to be students and then education and curriculum and research. Because our first, and prior, first priority that we're really focusing on um, in terms of identifying gaps at UBC is really facilitating uh, what's happened 
to a degree of success at the Faculty of Medicine, but making sure that we expand on that and improve it in other areas of the university. We have uh, James Andrew here, who's been a big part of uh, running the Aboriginal Admissions Program for the Faculty of Medicine, and we know the success that that has had and the impact that has had, but at the same time, we know that that needs to be done across the disciplines at UBC. Students also need support, not only in terms of getting into a program, but also the financial support and the social support that it takes. And so things that we're working on are identifying funding sources for things like scholarships and bursaries so that we can bring more students into the field of the health disciplines because as I mentioned last night and, has it, and how it's been mentioned a few times is really developing the capacity and representation of our people in the health disciplines. And that's another area that we would focus on. The other thing is a support network for students so that if they're interested in pursuing health careers, that we can help them along the spectrum. I think, and our group thinks, and I think overall, this is what we've heard, is that universities have a responsibility to help students get to them, not just help them when they're there. So first of all, it's the admissions programs that we have. It's also the recruitment, seeing potential that's out there and helping guide them into programs that, that, they, that they want to get into. It's also what we call retention, but really it's the support so that they stay there, they're successful, that they're happy there in a culturally competent environment that provides them the resources and what they need to succeed in whatever path they choose. And there are little bits of it at UBC, but this is one of our main focuses in terms of improving that. The partnerships, as I said, is the unifying theme of this entire center. And so if, if there's one thing that we could ask is please take the, your handout so that you have our contact information. Any ideas you have, any concerns, any suggestions, feel free to contact us. There's a website at UBC where you can get a full, you can see the full proposal that, we present, that we'll send out to Senate, but also at the same time, we have also done our best to engage in as many people as we can, whether it's within the university as an internal partnership, whether it's between the faculties, whether it's outside the university, whether it's academic people, or whether it's organizations and communities. And, um, and that's what we're really trying to do. And focusing on the fact that, yes, the proposal is being put forward to Senate, but it's a draft proposal. And Senate might get a little bit upset about that. And the way I describe that is, it's not a draft proposal. It'll be final as of November 6th, when the due date is to send it into Senate. But on November 7th, if an idea comes up, the university will not stop us from improving and making this center fit what the communities want. And I think that with the leadership that we have at the center, uh, if there's one thing I can assure you is that we, we're very, very comfortable with making sure that the university understands the importance that this center is gonna be not static, but something that grows and improves with suggestions and input from people like you who are taking an afternoon to, to share your thoughts. So again, the Center for Excellence, these are the goals. I hope by now that just hearing about the pillars of the center and what it's about and the process it's going through, that these goals are not gonna be surprising in terms of improving wellness and moving down those lines. We want your thoughts. We want your ideas. We don't expect them all to be positive, all to be um, suggestions for change. Whatever it is, we want to make sure that you feel comfortable communicating with us so that we can make this a center that's going to be successful. The only way it can be successful is that if it answers to the people that we're hoping to touch. Thank you. So now, uh, what I'd like to do is we have, let's see, it's crazy. Can you believe we only have 19 minutes left? So first of all, is there anyone here that's going to leave without the handout? Anyone? Awesome. Okay. Mission accomplished. So the next thing is, I thought we, what we could do is take, yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll pass them out. We'll make sure that they're there for you on your way out. 
And uh, we have them, right? Yeah, good. Thank goodness, after all that. <laughs> Trust me, the kind of day I'm having, sometimes I wonder. I thought what we could do is focus on one pillar, for lack of a better term right now. Why don't we focus on one thing? And if there's any suggestions, questions, the entire team that's been sort of the, the core group here uh, is here. Uh, unfortunately, Chief Wayne Christian had to step out. Dr. Kessler is away. Louise Naismith has, has been a, a guiding force. And the administration from UBC is not here. But I think that we have a, a significant core group of us here that if there's any questions, um, ideas, thoughts, um, please feel free to voice them. And I thought what we'd start off first with is students, knowing that what we'd been talking about is even the First Nations Health Authority, talking about increasing the representation of Aboriginal people in the healthcare professions. What can this center do to help students do that? Any thoughts? Right there. Kids have a perception of, you know, getting into the health field is doctors and nurses. Yeah. And I've been advertising and saying there's more to it than that. I said there's a whole book, and I lost the book, but um, on all the different phases. And, and to me, right now, with all of us going into our different health um, um, agent, little agencies or clinics and that, it's, you know, more important now than ever. So we have to advertise that to the kids. It isn't only this and that. There's a whole array of services. That is an excellent, excellent point, is that healthcare professions are not just doctors and nurses. And that was one of the things that UBC pointed out to us when we at first focused really just on the faculty of medicine. And so absolutely, we have speech and audiology, we have dentistry, we have social work, we have, and then of course, it, it's, there's different types within those. So we, when we're looking at nursing, we're looking at LPNs, RNs, nurse practitioners for our rural communities, which are often the First Nation communities up north. Absolutely. And then working so that they understand that, that's, that, um, that there's that range of potential. Because quite honestly, um, if you were to say to me that I was going to be a nurse tomorrow on the family medicine ward, I would be lost. You know, I may be a surgeon one floor up on the surgery ward, but I absolutely respect the work that those nurses do. It's a skill set that's different, and it's a team that actually makes that care optimal. So if I can ask you a favor, if you have any resources for us in terms of uh, a contact or something, um, that would be wonderful so that we can make sure that this center has those little out, uh, outreachings to those outside of the university. I think we're doing it well in the university, but outside the university, it would be great. Thank you. Right there, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, Dr. Karen, Carol, Carolyn Small Lakes, Treaty 7, Alberta region. I just wanted to share with you that in Alberta, we do what we call a Health Horizon Days, and it's in partnership with the University of Alberta. Our children learn more by ha hands-on learning. So we have implemented Health Horizons, and what we do is we take students from the community, um, high school students, grade seven to 12, we take them to Edmonton, and the University of Alberta walks them through their whole medical di uh, discipline department. There's the nursing, the doctors, the mental health field, and they get to try these hands-on if it's available for them. We found that to be a great success, especially for the K to 12 area. But again, it's focusing from seven to 12. And that has promoted a lot of people because the kids then go back home to the communities and say, I want to, you gotta see this, you gotta try this. So, if, and, and I would, for, I'll forward the information. Th thank you, that, I think you've hit on a huge point is that um, you can't, just relying on textbooks and, and, uh, and the regular teachers in their elementary and high school environment, it's been successful for some, but how do we ad attach it to other, uh, you know, other opening their horizons? And that's a great idea. And it's, it's that we are tar hoping that we will have things in place to target even the young 
the kindergarten kids, the grade seven kids, the, uh, the high school kids. And I think what you focused on there is to make it fun, to make them realize that learning can be fun and that everything's in their, in their, everything's an opportunity for them and giving them that message. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll do one more on the, t on the student section. There's a question back here or yeah. a comment. Yeah, I'd, I would just like to kind of um, wonder, well, I'm actually wondering how you're connecting the students then back to the community, not so much the students connecting with UBC, because they can go there and they can get the training, but how do they then integrate that into, say, northern communities? Um, because that's pretty far-reaching, and for us, we have a northern university, and we work quite well with them uh, in the remote and rural communities. But if we're looking at doctors coming back into the north, when there's so much competition, how are you addressing those issues? That's, that's great. And, and again, when we say we, there's no way that we could take actually credit for any of this uh, it, ourselves, because it, what we're trying to do is actually more focus and bring this as a unifying point to get this type of information. But how we can help is first of all, make sure that that voice is heard. But what UBC is doing, for example, is the Northern Medical Program. So the medical school has the main program down in Vancouver, but it also has distributed sites. And one of them is in Prince George. And then the students go up to Prince George and then they have distributed sites for the Northern Medical Program. So they go to Terrace or they go to Fort St. John and they, and they go around. And so far it's a relatively new program in the scope of medicine because it takes about you know, eight to nine years for a specialist, at least six years for a family doc once they get into medical school. But we're starting to see the data already that shows that if someone comes from a rural program and if they train in, uh, in the northern area where they're more exposed to rural medicine and patients coming in from rural areas, they're more likely to stay there or go to a comparable community. The other thing that I think we can do is actually expose these students more to the type of community, even if they're, even if they, um, what's what's available right now is one month rotations here and there. But to actually increase exposure to Aboriginal health through clinics, such as I see Murray Krause here from the Central Ontario Native Health. You know, there's other centers through many of the places where UBC students are and really working on the curriculum, which is the education section. So a nice leeway into this section is making sure that they have exposure so that they can realize that with going to rural communities and Northern communities and Aboriginal First Nation communities is challenge, but excitement and a, an incredible opportunity. And the, the physicians that go there, the feedback that they give these students is uh, that They've gone there by choice, they love it, and they want to stay there. And I think as long as we keep giving those students that exposure and experience, they realize they have an option to do that, and they're not, and they're not, and they're opening up their the sort of net. What used to happen when I went through UBC, you could only go to UBC in Vancouver. I bounced around between St. Paul's Hospital, which is downtown here, Vancouver General Hospital, the largest hospital in Vancouver, and UBC out on the campus, those are the only places I was exposed to. There was no northern program to choose from, there was no Aboriginal health rotation, and all of that is being addressed through curriculum. But I think, again, an important point, and we'll certainly be writing that down as another point brought up in this session, so thank you. So we'll switch to education now, just for time purposes. It, uh, but we sort of touched it on already. Education section of this is really curriculum development. We have Leah Walker here who has done a tremendous job in that with some of you have probably been touched in some way or another by the learning circle. Who here has seen the, or been in, participated in the learning circle? Yeah, and so, and one of the things is, that's uh, Leah Walker behind that. And so we, we have some programs in the Faculty of Medicine, but what else can we do? What else would do you guys see as gaps or ideas um, for education that this center potentially can bring to the proper uh, table or actually do ourselves? Yes.
return back to our community. Sometimes they're, I guess, you know, exposed to a little bit, no disrespect, but uh, exposed to a little bit of um, lateral violence. It's so notable. Mm. You know, the, our own people would not want to go see their own, their own doctor, their own nurse, their own dental therapist. They'd rather see someone else you import. import. And then if they don't like the, the import, they, then they'll come complain some more. So my question is, how would you develop it, the, the, the mentorship? It really depends on the, on the students' growth as well. You know, when they when they growing up in a, in a reserve or not, you know, you it's your foundation that really builds that strength in you. But if you don't have that foundation, but you have the you have the capacity to go get your prereqs to get into any course, you're fine. But when it comes back to going back to the community, you know, I I learned the hard way not to segregate my people because like be back then, you know, I am like, you know, if we're gonna train you, you come back here. Now I let go and said, okay, it's the universe. The, the, these guys can go wherever they want. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how you would put that into the program of mentoring, because I think that's something that's really important for a lot of communities. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And we've, we've certainly heard that. Um, mentoring is going to be a significant goal of ours. And I think, again, sort of looking at Leah and James both do that in the Faculty of Medicine already. And uh, James plays a key role in that, even in pre-med students, but certainly in the medical students that are, get in uh, to UBC um, that are Aboriginal. And uh, I think that's important. Part of that is gonna be role modeling in terms of the more Aboriginal students that we get into UBC that are incredible right now. They are absolutely humbling individuals to meet. Um, and then the, as we see the success of our people and they branch out into various areas of health care, whether it's doctors and nurses or everything else, I think role modeling is a big role. But I think one of the things we're also doing is making this a focal point so that those students realize that this is a place that they can also play a role of giving back. And so the, I think of role modeling as a very passive thing. So as you succeed, people look and say, aha, if she did it or he did it, then I can do it. Mentoring is very different. Mentoring is very active. It's the person picking up the phone and saying, how are you doing? You know, what, what's going on? What are your challenges? Or the individual feeling comfortable picking up the phone and, and doing that. And I think this, this center is gonna be a place where we are hoping to set up a mentorship program that's very active in that fashion. And then working with the communities, those partnerships. So these communities can pick up the phone, not just for the research idea that they have or the conundrum over an ethics proposal that they're not sure whether they trust, not just, but also for saying, you know what, one of our students is in your program in nursing at UBC, and we're hoping to set up a rotation where they can come back and be a nurse for one of their rotations here in our community. How do we talk to UBC to do that? There's gonna be people at our center that can really uh, work that and understand the process and partner with you to help keep those connections but keep them in a way that fit what the community wants and what the individual wants and I, I think it's a brilliant brilliant point because you do see that it, when people leave their community um, how to keep that connection and keep it an honest one and keep it a comfortable one where both everybody gains yes That's okay. The, uh, the, uh, the medical uh, studies at uh, UBC, are they looking at integrated medicine? Is that the direction that they're going? By integrating medicine, what do you mean? Uh, it's just like I'll take the Chinese people, for instance. Uh, Dr. Richard Hung from, uh, from uh, Edmonton practices integrated medicine okay. where the Chinese medicine and the Western medicine, because he's both, he's Western trained and Chinese trained. And because uh, I find that our medicine is very similar to the Chinese medicine. And uh, so is this the direction that uh, the research is going into integrated medicine? That's a great question. And it's actually come up at a couple sessions I've been at so far. Um, and for the most part, what are, that would go into actually into the curriculum, so into the education. And so one of the things that we have put in our proposal is recognizing 
to have more Aboriginal content within the curriculum, but also have potential for electives in traditional medicine. We don't control that curriculum. We would not and we are not asking to have that level of control, but certainly we have people in our group, like Leah Walker sits on the curriculum committee, and um, we, what we would do is be that voice to say, you know, we're talking about increasing the potential for rotations for a student to go to a First Nations community and understand what it's like to do 50% of your healthcare by telemedicine. What a wonderful opportunity as they hop on the helicopter and off they go. We want to make that available, but at the same time, if they want to be uh, working in a different center, in a different context, le learning from a traditional uh, healer, then how do we help to set that up? We don't control the out ultimate curriculum, but we can control the fact that experiences should be made available and how important it is to start addressing traditional medicine because it is an issue that came up yes last evening in the plenary session. It came up today in the BC Cancer Agency session. And I think that with enough voices, they're going to start hearing it. And if that's what we hear from individuals at, with the feedback, then our job is not to say what should be done, but to listen to what people need and want and to help facilitate that as a focal point on campus for the Center for Excellence. So we have, we have one minute and 15 seconds. Do we have a research question? Okay, you got your hand up, I can't say no. Sego, hello, my name's Nahani. Um, my uh, question is more of an invitation to talk to you because I think um, the program that I work for kind of touches on all three topics. Um, I also work in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC for a project called Aboriginal Youth Entering BC. And uh, we work with Aboriginal youth, youth across the province from grade six to 12. And we pair them with uh, a university mentor. Um, and the whole focus is to help kids um, not close doors along the way so that when they get to grade 12, they have these opportunities to pursue whatever it is they want. And um, our focus is in health sciences because we all know that we have um, a lack of First Nations professionals in the field. So um, I'd really love to talk to you about the program. Um, I have a booth downstairs. I'm just afraid that you're going to leave and I'll lose you in the crowd. Okay. No. <laughs> so please come find me. We will get contact information before you leave for okay. sure. Thank you. Thank you. And this is a perfect example. A, a fellow person from UBC, not both of us sort of passing in the wind and not realizing that we have the same passion as do the rest of the team here. And so it, it's, it's hopefully, again, how we kind of think of it sometimes is an umbrella under which anything to do with Indigenous health can be housed in terms of that partnership so that people can come in and out, whether they have a research concern, a research question, an opportunity, a curriculum um, uh, suggestion, um, funding for scholarships for students, whatever it happens to be, we're hoping to be that focal point. And so what I would suggest is, if this is the first time you've heard of the Center for Excellence, please go to the website. Please feel free to send in uh, any comments. If you're from an organization or you know of an organization that this in any way could touch, if, could you please f feel free to forward on their name? And then what we'd make sure to do is, we've tried to reach out to, to in individual organizations, but it's, if we could just make sure that we feel that they know that we're out here trying to do this so that that type of feedback never gets lost in the shuffle or in the end of a session. So thank you very much. Before we wrap up, what I'd like to do is there are some people that have been working incredibly, incredibly hard on this project. So if you guys could just stand up. So Leah Walker, and who's been really leading up the education. James Andrew, who's heading up the Aboriginal admissions. Jen Mackey, who does everything. <laughs> um, and uh, like I said, Wayne, Wayne Christian was here before. Marty Schechter, Dr. Marty Schechter, the founding director of the School of Population and Public Health, where this is also ultimately going to be housed. It was here before as Marty. I think Marty had to leave. Um, and again, not all of our crew is here. But um, I was up here talking, but in no way, shape, or form, the only person. This is a huge project, um, and we're excited uh, as we move forward for the Senate proposal. Thank you so much for your, for your participation. And we're going to be hanging around up here and outside. Please feel free to come up and talk to us.
Yeah, and the handouts are going to be, Jen, the handouts are going to be at the back? Oh, they're already handed out. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. integration of traditional healing with the medical system with Dr. Ted Mala. Uh, Dr. Ted Mala is a recognized chief in health in Alaska and an honorary chief in Hawaii. Thank you and good afternoon and thank you for coming to this session. Um, every time we hold a session because it hits such a nerve in who we are and what we do. My name is Ted Mala. I'm Eskimo and Russian. I'm from the, the nation of Buckland, which is up in the Arctic, Arctic Alaska. Did you get my good sign? Okay. And um, uh, so I'm the first native doctor from Alaska, first male, and I've been around a long time. And I've been the minister of health all these things, thank you. Um, well, I'm just telling you this, not to impress you, but just to tell you, and that I have a lot of experience, except with microphones. Uh, I used to teach for many years, and um, for the last 15 years, I've run the traditional healing clinic. We started it at the Alaska Native Medical Center. Have some of you been to Alaska? Yes, 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 anybody? Oh, a few. Well, we need to get the rest of you up there. Um, so today I want to share thoughts about not so much what is traditional healing. We'll include that. But the topic is, the topic is, uh, how do you integrate it into a system? That's a tough thing because most of us know traditional healing. Um, if you're indigenous, it's, it's just what we do. So it's, uh, it's, we already know what it is, so you don't need somebody to tell you what it is. Besides, and here comes the, the good microphone. Okay, is that better? Um, so the, um, you don't need to know what traditional healing is because if you really think about traditional healing and what it is, I have no idea. Um, we're writing a book on traditional healing and we've been working on it for 12 years, and it's still not done, and we can't figure it out. It's like, some of you have a public health background. It's like, what is public health? Nobody really knows. Well, traditional healing, what we did was we went and we interviewed elders, <clears throat> and we said, what is traditional healing to you? And so we decided we're gonna publish this book because it's impossible to say what it is. We know it works. We know it's been around over 10,000 years. Um, and we know people have a great hunger for it. And so I'm gonna show you a few slides because every conference needs slides. I don't like slides, but uh, some people like numbers, so we have to put up some graphs and numbers. Then you'll feel fulfilled because uh, you've seen your graphs and numbers. But the most important part will be questions and discussions of, uh, and I will tell you after the little slideshow um, how we did it. Um, you know, we have a saying up north that if you're not the league dog, the view's always the same. <laughs> and we thought for many years 
that we were just in the back of the pack. And then one day we discovered that we were the lead dog and that was very scary. So I'm gonna go get the pointer. Now I have something to do with both hands. Um, in the back, I've left some of these things and there'll be a few more things in the back from traditional healing. You could certainly write to us. Um, and I tell people, what I tell you today is um, just to give you ideas. Don't copy it, adapt it to yourself. Because every uh, reserve, every village, every town has a different way of doing things. We have um, half of the tribes of the United States are in Alaska. We have like 235 and everybody's different and everybody has their own way to do things. So there's no one right way, especially in traditional healing. You know, you need to follow your heart and see what the community wants. So I hope you can see this. Um, it's just the cover now. Let's see. Programs that work. So we have a program called NUKA, N-U-K-A. Some of you have heard of it. NUKA is a system of health. What happened was, as Native people, uh, we said um, the feds, the federal government, always ran our health care. And so after a while, we said, it's not working. It's just not People aren't getting well. Something's wrong. So the Congress of the United States passed a law, and the law said, um, Native people, um, if you want to, you can take over your own services and just do it. So we said, okay, and we're one of the first to do it. So we're 99% compacted, which means we kind of um, took over the whole thing. It was an act of faith. It was very, uh, oh my gosh, it's like jumping off without a parachute. Uh, but we did it, and we brought a lot of things into Native health, including traditional healing, things we never had in the hospital. We brought in complementary and alternative medicine. We brought in chiropractors. We brought in naturopaths. We brought in um, massage therapists, all these things that are on the road to health. And we redesigned the whole system, and it's called NUCA. And we've had, I think, uh, like 200 people from Canada already come up and look at it. And there's a big class in June. If you're interested, we can tell you about that. But it's basically, we won the Baldridge Award. Um, there's a lovely postcard going on the tables here about this class. It's so big, it takes a week to learn about it. But we won the Baldridge Award. <clears throat> which means it was one of the highest healthcare care um, awards in our nation. And the award came from the president's cabinet in D.C. and all this kind of stuff. Um, the Henry Ford Hospital was another one that won it. And a few, there was only four big names. But we're the first Native uh, organization to ever win that. And, and so now people have been coming not only from around the states, but around the world. Uh, to see what we're doing. And it's not perfect, but the fact is that we did it. You know, it might not be perfect. Some people, some tribes have come up and said, you know, this is my dream that our tribe could do this. But I never thought, I don't know if we'll ever do it because you know the native way is to, one gets ahead, four pull them down. But um, if we could, it, the, what happens when tribes agree? So we went into a room and fought like crazy and came out with one voice. Wow, was that powerful. If we can just come out with one voice. Uh, we're our own worst enemy everywhere, not only here, all over the states. Uh, but our senator, Ted Stevens, at the time said, if you guys don't agree, you're not getting a hospital. So we said, okay. And uh, so we learned how to, how to do that uh, because we're much more powerful than you think. And uh, all these things show it. So there's no shortage of people to tell you what you can't do. I'm gonna give you lots of little pearls and that's another one. There's no shortage. So when we wanted to take it over, there were tons of people that said, nah, the natives, you know, what do they know about health and how can you do it and so on. And uh, all of a sudden we, we had to prove them wrong and we won all these awards to do it. Um, so this, um, these are 
name dropper slide, but the feds usually need a slide like this. Um, this is our Minister of Health for the United States, Catherine Sebelius, the Director of Indian Health, who's a good friend of mine. We all belong to the Association of American Indian Physicians. And uh, Evan, uh, are you here, Evan? Evan is, uh, Dr. Evan is uh, also very close to us, and he comes to all our meetings, and, and there goes the slide. Uh, there it is. And so we got this award. And this is our uh, native CEO director. Uh, and uh, <laughs> um, I was wondering, what did I have for lunch? Um, <laughs> so on the left is uh, uh, Catherine Gottlieb, our CEO and director, and uh, Buzz, our clinic manager, and one of our tribal doctors, Lisa. And I'll talk to you in a little bit about what a tribal doctor is, what do they do, and so on get through the slides, and I told them, please don't give me slides with lots of words, because people just get headaches reading them. But we've been around 30 years. <laughs> That's what the slide says. And uh, <clears throat> now this is important, because we work, I was just in Norway last week with the Sami people, the native Sami people invited me to come up and talk about traditional healing and nuka and things we we're doing. And it's surprising that some members of government, by the way, came to that meeting, and it was amazing because people from the audience got up and started yelling at them, you never listen to us, you make these plans, you don't include us. And I was going, wow, we did that years ago. It sounds like Alaska and Canada all over again. And uh, it's amazing what we share in common. But, so we came up with our own measure of when we do something, we measure it against this. And if it doesn't connect to this, we don't do it. So we say that we are working with a native community to take care of the health of each person, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And that came up in your conference yesterday, the first day people were talking about that, not just the physical, but the spiritual the mental and emotional. People are hungry for this. People just want this. They don't want just to here, take a pill, call me in a month. Um, in fact, people come to our clinic and they say, well, you know, we have this problem and it's a, um, I'm going through stress and it's kind of a mental health problem and I went to my doctor and I got some pills and now my head's cloudy but I still have the same problem. <laughs> and so this is our measure. And um, we say this medicine has been around a long time. We're not saying it's better than Western medicine. We're saying it complements each other. Um, for those that need statistics, there they are. We have 301 doctors, we have 500 nurses, and so on. We see a lot of people. We see. Uh, we only see native people because it's a native hospital, and we see 2,000 patients a day. Huge. And they come from all over the state. That's the hospital. Wow. That is, uh, that's when you let native people design our own things and do our own, give us our wings and let us fly. The old, the old native hospital was a box. And it was designed by the feds, and actually part of it fell off when we had an earthquake. <laughs> so I tell people, let us fly. Um, so this main area is a hospital. This is primary care, um, the garage, and it just goes on and on. Um, actually, some and a lot more people are moving from the villages to the city. And that's a tough problem for us because we're not funded to take care of them, but we take care of any native person. So, um, and we've already outgrown this, believe it or not. We're, we have to start thinking about expanding now. <clears throat> so this is some of our tribal healers. Um, there was um, our, we have one tribal healer on the left. I, I'm extremely, pr I'm proud of all of them, but and Chantel, and I tell people that's our mascot, Shadow. Uh, Chantel is a native uh, person that we have a special program for PhDs and natives going into PhDs in psychology in Alaska. 
and she was in it. And, um, and she went to a whole bunch of hospitals and places looking for a practicum, and no one would take her because she's blind. And I said, I will take her immediately and do whatever it takes. Because I said, you're more powerful than a lot of people with sight. If you lose one sense, wow, you develop all the other senses. And she can feel things that nobody can. People walk in the door. And I had another tribal doctor in a wheelchair uh, from a plane accident. And um, there are people come in, and they want to commit suicide. And they're, oh, poor me, and um, all this stuff. And she would roll in the room with her wheelchair and totally, totally disable them. And all of a sudden, oh, the poor me went away. So our one of our strongest and secret weapons is always somebody that has other abilities that, that people don't see. And I'm so mad at the, well, it was good for me because the, the community that was doing internships did not accept her because she was blind. And I just feel that she was meant to be with us. And, and uh, what a great person statistics, lots of referrals, we get lots of chronic pain. You know, they asked to study traditional healing, and I just say no, I just don't. We don't write papers, we don't write books. Um, the best website, actually, is Dr. Kaiba's website here in Canada on traditional healing, because she's put together a lot of um, um, great statistics, and I know you coordinate traditional healing for the um, consul, is that what it is? Uh, for First Nations, anyway. Um, and we send people to your website. Uh, ours don't. Um, I'll tell you why. Because we use plants, we use herbs, we use all these things. And um, I, I work with the National Institutes of Health in Washington. Uh, I go there almost every month. And um, they want to study the plants. People come up and want to study our plants. And I kind of asked them, why do you want to study our plants? I mean, there are plenty of plant people around and medicine people. Why do you want to study it? And we talked to our consul of elders, and we said, no. No. And why? Because we're terrified that people will patent our medicines, and then we can't use them. So this is a strange world, you know? People want to study your genes, they want to study your hair, they want to study your plants, and unless you know somebody's heart, we don't let them in. We, we're very, very careful. Same with traditional healing. A lot of people want to come in and just be like traditional healing tourists, and I say, no, <laughs> no. I said, you can go into primary care for that. Um, well, we ask people, you know, we look, do you have a good heart? Are you coming in here because you love and respect Native people and want to help us with our medicine? Or you just want to write a book, you know, about how, how bad we are? So, and there's lots of that. Uh, this is intensive care. Um, this was a, a woman that was dying and... Um, it was incredible because I brought all the traditional healers over and we surrounded her bed and we held hands and they sung a song and did some drumming. And uh, she was so happy. So now the nurses uh, call us all the time uh, when there's a problem. Um, if uh, something is uh, wrong in a room or a bunch of people have died in the same room, they call us. and. Uh, so I go over there and I say, well, you know, we're not Ghostbusters. You need to know that. <laughs> and we're not shaman. And we, you, we have the same ability that you do, just to say a prayer and ask Creator to help us. Um, it's very important you separate the Hollywood traditional healer and the real one, the health one. Shamanism is a whole different thing. And, and and that's a discussion perhaps for another day. But we are traditional healers, not um, Hollywood actors. Um, so, and as you can tell, and many of you are women, women are much smarter than men, and 78% come to our clinic, and then they drag their male partners, the other 22% in. 
And then they're all happy. Then they can't go away. But you know how that works. We won't even go there. Um, <clears throat> lots of referrals, lots of chronic pain. But we see people for all kinds of things. What you need to know is that in traditional healing, we have two kinds of traditional healers. We have the physical and we have mental counselors. And they specialize in different things. It's really important to know that, um, and we use both sometimes too, but it's important to know that um, we try to take a holistic uh, approach. And uh, I only let people come in traditional healing by referral by referral from their primary care doctor. Why? Well, they don't really need a referral. That's how I treat, that's how I teach the primary care doctors, by making them refer the patient, or as we call them, customer owner, uh, they get dragged into the process whether they like it or not. And uh, it's really important in traditional healing that you don't get ahead of allopathic medicine, that Everyone, know, you have to be very transparent. You have to know what everybody's doing. And I even, and this is definitely the first for the record books, have tribal doctors charting on electronic medical records. Wow, can you imagine that? It's, uh, these are different times. But it's part of transparency. It's not because the patients need it. It's not because you know, we need to do it. It's how we bring primary care along. Because if they are opposed to it or think it's you're doing nothing but shamanism, the churches will run after you, the doctors will run after you, the public will run after you. The secret is transparency. Because we're not doing anything secret. We're just working with people and praying and doing massage and all those things you see on that pamphlet. So we get lots of patients from primary care. We have a nice garden. Um, it's not an ornamental garden, it's a working garden. So uh, we have a few ornamentals, like those things in the front, but um, most of the ones we have, and the traditional healers help harvest them, are traditional healing plants from all over Alaska. I think that's really important. We don't prescribe them in the hospital because um, we don't know all the interactions with Western medicine, but people uh, do them sometimes at home on themsel by themselves. Uh, but we do uh, keep them out there to teach. So we have hundreds of people that come. And I really suggest, even if you're beginning to think of traditional healing, maybe the first step is to plant a little garden outside your clinic and put some of our healing plants in there. Because there's no such thing as a weed. You know, that, that always makes me crazy when people buy things to kill weeds and all these things that Creator gave us. And, and we believe that everything has a purpose and everyone has a purpose. So um, you have to start education very gently. You just can't run in, we're taking over the clinic and, and the Trisha healers or whatever. No, start slowly. Start with the Trisha healing garden. Let the elders come and begin to teach on what is this. And um, this is something that has sustained our people for 10,000 years. It's not just some kind of new, new age thing that just came along. It's, it's kept us alive. And we have visitors, of course, as you do. They, these guys wander around, and the bears too, around the hospital. We get emails saying, bear on campus, you know, and try not to go out there until they shoo them away. <laughs> so here are some of the things we do. We do healing hands. Some of you have heard of healing hands. If you haven't, uh, there are courses on them. We teach also healing hands to some of our nurses, and it's really incredible, especially at end of life. The big problem, as you probably know, when someone is dying is not the patient. It's the family, you know. What do I do now? Uh, this person's dying. They're very close to me. Can I touch them? Uh, can I get near them? Can I talk to them? End of life is a very, it's a wonderful thing before one crosses over. But healing hands comforts a patient. You can look it up. You can Google it. Um, 
and people really need to be trained on how to um, relate to our elders and to the families when something happens uh, because um, it's just, just needed. Uh, in the hospital, we keep everything very sterile. Uh, nobody, remember, well, some of you remember the old days, uh, Madeline, like me, uh, when people had back rubs. Oh my God, they had back rubs in hospitals. And that was pretty wonderful because not so much, well, sure, it was for the um, skin to not break down and so on, but people need to be touched. It's amazing. Um, I was talking to a, a front desk uh, lady over at the Marriott, and um, I was saying, well, you know, I just wander around, talk to everybody, and uh, I enjoy that a lot, and um, smile and talk to people, and uh, she said, you know, I'm from the north of Canada, and we do that all the time. We smile, we go up and talk to people, but when I came to Vancouver, people thought I was crazy because I'm smiling too much and talking to them too much. So that's kind of what happens in a kind of a, a city thing. So healing hands and massage, people really need that. Um, we tell storytelling. When we, uh, we had a girl that um, was in our state psychiatric hospital, uh, a young native girl, and um, she uh, came from the village, she was acting out, and they all of a sudden put her on a plane and woke up and there she was in this hospital. It's kind of like when I went to residential school. One day I was happy at home, and the next day I was running around carrying a rifle. And I was only in second grade. But again, that's another story. But, um, so she didn't know what happened. And she got there, and um, she wouldn't talk to anybody for two weeks. And the psychiatrist, the psychologist, they'd give her medicine and they'd talk to nobody. So out of desperation, two weeks later, they called us at traditional healing. She came over, we sat down with her, we gave her some of her food. You know, in our clinic, we have salmon, we have walrus, we have seal, we have muck duck, we have all the, the native foods, beaver tail, whatever comes in that day. And we sat down and we shared some with her and we couldn't keep her quiet for two hours. So a lot of this is culturally relevant. A lot of it is just, you know, it's just, it's so obvious to me, it gives me a headache that um, people maybe take a course in cross-cultural and makes them an expert. But the thing is people just need human touch. Some of our own food doesn't hurt some pilot bread and uh, some tea. And, um, and I tell a lot of the residents and the doctors, um, and the key to counseling, in my opinion, is to keep quiet. Because counselors have to fill up every word. A lot of my patients are translating from Yupik Eskimo to English. It takes a while to get that out of your head. And, and meanwhile, the Western culture sometimes feel, well, you're obviously not very smart, and I will go on to the next question. And every minute has to be boom, boom, boom. But it's so surprising if you learn to just shut up and listen. And it's very hard. It's the hardest part. It's like praying, you know. God, give me this. God, give me that. Blah, blah, blah. Amen. If you learn to keep quiet, you'll be surprised. There's actually answers that come. And the only time Creator can often talk to us is when you are asleep and dreaming. So I tell people, write down your dreams. Often answers come in dreams uh, because we're so damn busy. Uh, and I want to do this, and I want to do that, and rah, 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 and poor God. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> cleansing. We do, we use drumming, we use singing, we use uh, things that are just native. I mean, it's just stuff we do. It's, uh, people think it's so exotic and it's a secret formula, but it's not, it's what we do. And, uh, and some people will get it and others will never get it. And it's just like grace, you know, amazing grace. Some people have it, some people don't. But it's what we do, so uh, 
it helps to hire a native counselor or someone from that background. We use talking circles. We use women's circles a lot. Um, if people are ready for it, we let them. Um, we, just, we figure out who should go into that and who should not. Um, it um, depends on their comfort zone. Um, today in Western medicine, uh, the therapy right now is group therapy. So if you have diabetes, chances are four or five patients will see the same doctor at the same time. That's kind of like, and they only get 15 minutes, and we take one to two hours with each person. And the other amazing thing is we don't get reimbursed. Our board and our consul uh, just support us. They say, just do it. We know how important it is. It takes three to six weeks to get in. It's so popular. Um, so it needs a commitment by the tribe. At one point, we talked about how to get reimbursed. And we had a big meeting with the United States federal government. <clears throat> and the government said, sure, we'll fund you. Um, and then as negotiations went on, it bottom line was, yeah, we'll fund you, but we have to license you. And, and then we have to set these standards. And people just walked out of the room. They said, you know, the government, at least our government, doesn't fund what they can't control. And they control it through licensing. We can't do that. Do you license priests? Do you license, uh, you know, other people? Um, so we said no. So we fund ourselves. And we don't have any casinos in Alaska. We just, uh, uh, our hospital has become so good that people, w anyone with insurance wants to go there, even though we see primary natives. We're the only level two trauma center in the whole state. I mean, more so than Providence Hospital or anywhere else. People want to come there. Firemen and policemen tell their families, if you get sick, ER, native hospital. And uh, uh, so that's a great compliment uh, because so many of our traumas and things come from our villages and we have to fly so far in um, that, um, that we try to do what we can uh, to save people's lives. Prayer, prayer is part of it. We pray with people. Uh, we're not technically, we, we pray to creator, but not a specific religion. We have a hospital, we have a chapel in our hospital and uh, the chapel is uh, just a quiet room and the light fixtures look like ice and people just sit there and talk to creator as they want. And I think that people in the hospital, the nurses and so on, are comfortable with us because we're very neutral. We just uh, go direct to Creator. And uh, it's not that any organized religion is a bad thing because there are people that are involved in that too. But, um, but the majority are just um, people uh, going direct to Creator. Um, songs and dances, consultations with elders, uh, some of our tribal doctors are elders, and of course the traditional healing garden. Um, <clears throat> so it took me a, a couple years to figure this out, but um, people would say, oh yeah, I want to go to Hawaii when it's February and it's dark and it's cold. And, and you say Hawaii and it's amazing how many faces are smiling right now. Um, <laughs> You say Alaska is not that big a smile, but Hawaii, especially in Alaska, Hawaii is very good. So I finally became very smart and married a native Hawaiian. <laughs> and so we go back and forth, yes. <laughs> I highly recommend that therapy. Uh, and we work with the traditional healers in Hawaii. Some of you have been to Hawaii, yes? Some? Yes, good. So as, maybe as many as Alaska. That's a good word to learn because it's, uh, and they have incredible traditional healing. These are pictures of our healers together with some of the Hawaiian healers. And they do chants, they do prayers, they use traditional medicines. The only sad thing is the United States government has not recognized them as native people, which is crazy. Um, and it's uh, like a status, non-status is equally crazy. And, and these are all native people and they're not recognized. We're working on it. There's bills in all the time, but the thing that stopped it is natives 
fighting amongst themselves, the usual. And, um, but uh, that's what we do. I don't know why, but we do that. Um, Alaska, your northern neighbors, uh, we have all these languages, the Gwich'in, Inupia, that's where I'm from, way up in the top. Um, I used to live in Siberia. Um, no, I wasn't being punished. I just, uh, <laughs> I messed going Russian, so in the 80s, I wanted to go over there and work. And um, actually, in the 70s, uh, I know Madeline Stout from Jean Goodwill. I used to come over and work when I was a young doctor with the indigenous nurses of of Canada, what an incredible group. Jean Goodwill, oh my gosh, what a powerful, legendary person. And um, anyway, so we still have all these languages going and uh, we have something called circumpolar health. Um, one day <coughs> we said, you know, a lot of programs that we are using in Alaska don't work. They depend on roads, they depend on communication, they depend on people working, they depend on salaries. So one day we took the globe, one of these globes, and where the pole, the hole is on the top, we looked at it and drew a circle, and we showed all the countries around the North Pole, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Greenland, Norway, Canada, Alaska, and Russia. And we said, why are we bringing all these programs from the lower 48 when all these countries have the same problem? So we formed the Circumpolar Health. Canada's very strong in that. We had the, one, of, uh, one of the last meetings were in um, ye ye Yellow Knife, Yellow Knife. Um, and the next one's in Oulu. Um, we started the International Union for Circumpolar Health. And um, you should, uh, get on the internet sometime and go to this international union or Google circumpolar health and look at all the papers that are presented by Canada as well as all these other countries on how to approach the same problems. And we learn really great things. Like when we designed the new psychiatric hospital, I sent the architect to Sweden. And the reason I sent him to Sweden was because there were really ugly buildings over there. They were long and very non-beautiful, um, if you will. <laughs> uh, but when you walked in the building, there was magic. These are people that live in the same environment that was dark and cold and blah, blah, blah. And they designed the building from the inside out. The problem in the United States, and I'm sure in Canada from what I've looked at, is a lot of architects build the outside very nice, but inside is useless. Well, the important thing is in psychiatric hospital, we wanted windows that opened because people, native people coming in there need fresh air. They don't want just recycled <coughs> air. Uh, so what if it's a little more expensive? And the law in Sweden was when you build a workplace environment, every human being shall have n access to natural light. Look at all the closets a bunch of, bunch of you probably are sitting in right now with no windows. That's totally unhealthy. I had one of those too when I started at the university and I had a friend in Guatemala paint me a painting of a window so at least I could look out. <laughs> <laughs> but these people are very smart and we learn this just by comparing things. We joined Winter Cities, and Winter Cities took, um, said, okay, people that live in the dark like us, uh, start putting up white lights on your trees and stuff, which we do all over Anchorage, and uh, just brighten up. And so there are a lot of ideas out there. It's just connecting with Circumpolar Health and finding out what everybody else is doing in um, the same kind of environment. <coughs> so like you, we have lots of languages. Um, Every healer has their own gifts. Everyone has healing energy. Energy is part of the system of the body, the electrical system. And uh, I use a simple example uh, to show you your own energy because everyone basically is a healer. Every human being has that. So uh, today's show and tell, I want you to take your hand and uh, here, George. And then put them as close as you can together without 
touching. And you're going to feel energy closer, closer, closer without touching. And all of a sudden, you're going to feel that tingling. And that, that's your energy. Everyone has an energy field. It's just a matter of how to use it. Everyone is born with healing energy. So when you go to sleep, watch this tonight. Um, some people put their hand on their head to go to sleep. Some people put it over their heart. Look, watch where your hands go. Um, and that's that energy that soothes. And we do it subconsciously. There are a lot of things we do we don't even know. A child has an injury or a headache. Mom will put her hands on that child or where it hurts. And that's that energy. And we use that energy in traditional healing to, uh, to help heal. There are lots of ways to heal. There are many paths to healing. And traditional healers have many gifts. That's why some just do the physical and some do the mental. But actually, you cross the line a lot doing both. Um, so we are looking for tribal doctors, uh, always, always, always. Um, in our medical center, one of the realities of today is that no one can touch a patient unless they're squeaky clean. That means you have to pass all the background stuff. You have to never committed a felony. I have to look at the time because I can easily, easily blow off the time. Um, and uh, you have to look at all these things to see um, before we let any, even a volunteer, before we let anyone touch anyone, you have to be assured that this person is squeaky clean. So the squeaky clean test doesn't always work. I, I often want to recruit someone as a traditional healer and then they did something when they were young and it follows them around. So that's difficult. Um, it's like electronic medical records. One of my pet peeves is, well, mates, maybe you were 17 and you were drinking and the chart says alcoholic or drinking. Well, maybe you stopped when you were 18 and now you're 50 years old and still following you around. So one of my arguments is we've got to update records so that something you did a long time ago, and if it's over, it's over. Why are you keeping it on there? So um, one, of the, one of the problems is um, making sure people can pass this, um, this test. Um, <clears throat> we mentor people. We have a young people's group where our traditional healers have a talking circle, and uh, we have young Native people with gifts. So I'll bet you, you know young Native people that said, well, you know, I have dreams. And then they come true. I can feel somebody that they're going to die. Somebody's going to die, and bang, they die. And this really scares me. I can feel a fire and I see it, and then somebody's house burns down, and all these kinds of things. Where did it come from? Um, how do I control it? Am I crazy? Um, but it just seems to happen. So we talk to them, because we feel that people have gifts that are given to you. Um, not that you deserve them, they're just given. It's part of your vision. I think people need to understand why you were born in life. Why was I born? Was I born to make money? Was I born to teach? Was I born to whatever? I think part of our mission in life is to figure out your vision quest and to figure out why you were born and to do something about it. And I honestly believe that if you are not doing what you were born to do, you're going to get sick. There was a doctor in New York um, years ago that was diagnosed with a type of uh, cancer, and the doctor, his doctors at Mayo Clinic said, you have six months to live. Okay, what am I going to do? It's like that movie, you had six months, and remember the woman that goes out and maxes out all her, Chris, her, her charge cards and stuff and lives it up, and then she gets a note saying, oops, we made a mistake, it wasn't, it wasn't you, we switched the test. But anyway, he went, he said, well, you know, I'm going to do what I've always dreamed of doing. I'm going to go to Hawaii, 
and I'm going to write a book. And he did. And of course, it's the fairy tale thing. Not only was he there, he realized he couldn't control his own life. He wrote his book, and of course, he met the love of his life. And even though he was told that six months he will die, um, a year later, he was still alive. And he went back to the Mayo Clinic. Cancer was gone. So he started teaching something called psychoneuroimmunology. And it's the power of the mind. And the mind is so incredible. And we teach this people in traditional healing. If you program yourself to fail, you will. I'm going to get cancer. I'm going to get cancer. My mother had it. My father had it. I'm going to get cancer. You will. Oh, I made a mistake. I'm so stupid. You are. <laughs> and then they teach you to say, cancel, cancel. Soon as you have a negative thought about yourself, cancel it and replace it with something positive. So they did all this research on psychoneuroimmunology, and they came down to the basics basically saying, well, if you really want to cure yourself and go on your journey and be a healthy person, one of the things was to do something for somebody else half an hour a day. Do something for somebody else. And the next thing was to do something physical. Patients come to me all the time, and I go to primary care, and um, I have diabetes, and they say, well, I have diabetes. Uh, I'm not going to change my life, but give me more insulin. Give me another pill. Give me something. We as Native people have been trained to that. People in my generation, the residential school people, we were always taught that everybody was better than us. And the doctors knew better than you. And they came in with their white coats. By the way, we've gotten rid of white coats. And, and also we've gotten rid of the rooms. These, when you let Natives design it, hello, it changes. Um, you know, when we go to the doctor for something minor, take off your clothes, put on the gown, sit there, and we'll eventually be there. Now, in primary care, we designed it. We have talking rooms. So when you come in the clinic, you don't take off your clothes. You just sit around. And the doctor goes in this little circle and talks with you. And we talk about, well, what's wrong? And only 20% actually need to disrobe. And so we, we've gotten rid of this God complex, and we tell people in traditional healing, um, if you're not happy, it's your fault, because you are responsible for your own happiness. And if you're ill, you're your own doctor. We have people sit around in a circle, and we give them our best advice. You're the doctor. You're responsible for your own health. And you take whatever advice that you want to, but you're ultimately responsible for yourself. So as young people in boarding school and other places, we are always told, we know better than you. You know, we're from the government. We're here to help you. And all these good things that we were raised on. And after a while, the government ran out of money and other things. And all of a sudden, they said, well, you're on your own. <laughs> so in traditional healing, if somebody comes in uh, intoxicated. <clears throat> we don't see them. If they come in abusing drugs, we don't see them. You have to have a clear mind. And, and you have to be able to establish a partnership with us. In my village, which is Buckland, which is only 400 people, but a very healthy village, we don't have any roads. We just got flush toilets this summer. Um, and I'd always pound the government saying, you know, for the price of a missile, we could have fixed this two decades ago. But anyway, another story. And so the kids weren't going to school. Uh, they're just sleeping in. They wouldn't show up. And so everybody's frustrated. So finally, someone came up with the bright idea saying, OK, we're going to bring in the parents, the child, and the teacher, and you're going to sit at this table, and you're going to sit down, and we're going to do a contract. 
What are you, the student, going to do? What are you, the parents, going to do? What are you, the teacher, going to do? And we sat down, and they started showing up again. So it's giving us responsibility back in our lives. We've lost too much of it. It's been taken away, all in good faith. You know, people always felt we're, we have to help those Native people, the missionaries, that was their mantra. A lot of people wanted to be saved. In, in Russia, um, boats, after Gorbachev um, went away and all this, these boats started showing up of missionaries. I have nothing against missionaries, but I'm just telling you that they would show up, and the Russian people would tell me this, native people, and they would say, um, okay, um, of course, you know, you, you get all this clothes and food, but you have to listen to our speech. And, and they would say to me, Ted, um, every boat that comes along says they represent the true God. And we have a relationship with Creator, and we've been Orthodox for thousands of years. Um, what do we do? Everyone that comes along, the next one is the true God. And I think that happened to us as natives because everyone wanted to save us. Everyone had a solution for us. Everybody knew better. So the sad thing is that, well, I didn't have a role model when I was young. I had boarding school, so I didn't have to make many decisions. But somehow I got a good education beaten into me. And, um, and I didn't know what to do. I wanted to go to school. I didn't know. So I said a prayer to Creator and closed my eyes, put my finger on the map, and that's where I went to school. And I said, the rest will sort itself out. I went to, I landed on Mexico, the first one, and I didn't know Spanish. I knew taco and enchilada, but that's about it. I took Spanish in school, but you know, like most people, didn't learn a thing. Um, so I just went there and I said, I'm gonna learn it. Because there were so many people telling me what I couldn't do. You're native, you're native. Uh, why are you even going to college? Oh, you're native. Well, then you should study anthropology. So, you know, we'd always say, there's, what's a typical native family, you know? Mother, father, two kids, and an anthropologist. <laughs> and how we were raised. In fact, if you want to see nervous people walk into an anthropology conference, when native people walk in, not a pretty sight. <laughs> So you see, traditional healing isn't Hollywood. It's not a bunch of mumbo jumbo. It's real life. We have to walk in two worlds with one spirit. And that's just the way it is. In the old days, you were a hunter, a man. And, and your partner um, had children. Uh, took care of the sewing, cooked dinner. You had to survive together. But today, people don't need each other. There are opportunities for women and men. I have friends that are reindeer herders in Siberia, and it's dying out, not because of the reindeer, but they can't find women that follow the, the men who follow the reindeer all year round, because women have lots of opportunities that they're starting to use. So I think relationships are one of true love and not, not necessity necessarily anymore. But all these things play into traditional hailing because we look at the uh, evolution of the family, the evolution of relationships, the evolution of people that no longer are getting married, the doing all kinds of things that we um, was, was not done in our generation, but it still continues to live because it's very true. And if you really are convinced that you want your spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional health, you have to balance all of that. You have to accept people, and you have to use what we were brought up with. Um, inside of you, you're carrying thousands of years of genes of your ancestors. And a lot of people are something and something. I'm Eskimo and I'm Russian. Um, 
and, um, and part of it is finding out who you are, why you do things. When I went to Russia, I was surprised, wow, uh, that's maybe why I do things. I don't know. Um, and so part of it is finding out who you are. Part of it is not reading books and becoming a stereotype of, oh, you're a native, you should work in a museum or something like that. Or, you know, you should be living in a sod house and not a HUD house. Actually, one of the things happened in the Arctic HUD, which is the housing division of the U.S. government, came up and they, we had sod houses in our uh, village, which actually were quite comfortable. Um, and they said, no, you can't live in these sod houses because um, because you should live in a modern house. So um, we're going to give you a modern house. So they tore down the sod houses, gave us a modern house, but they neglected to tell us that the government works on lowest bidder. And the Arctic wind ripped through these houses that were manufactured in California. And then after that, uh, oh, you have a house, you need electricity, you need heating, you need oil, you need um, telephone. And all of a sudden, people said, sure, sign me up. There was no way to pay for it. There's like a couple jobs in a village. Postmaster, grocery store, city hall, IRA, tribal. Um, that's it. And some seasonal work. So how... Are you supposed to go from a subsistence economy to a cash economy? In fact, most people live on both. Um, everyone goes home in the summer. And, uh, and one thing that makes employers crazy is the native people say, OK, I have to go home now because uh, it's summer. And I have to help put up fish and pick berries. And I have to, that's just what we do for our survival. And uh, employers sometimes get really mad at that. But that is a really important relationship to the earth, to Mother Earth, uh, to keeping their culture alive. Again, walking in two worlds with one spirit is really, really important because that will help you, ground you mentally as well as physically. So if you feel lacking, and then I have other people that say, well, you know, I was born in... Seattle, but I, I have no idea what a native is. And that's part of their journey, to come home and learn. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't matter. You need to know who you are if you're going to get somewhere and, um, and, again, find out why you were born and why are you carrying all these thousands of years of genes. Thousands of years of genes we're carrying with us. And we have our ancestors. And I tell my patients too, you have to learn to start talking to your grandmother. You need to start talking to your ancestors. You need to ground yourself. You need to, there's a lot of people that want to help. And as native people, you have uh, a strong, strong culture um, that is going to make you whole, but you have to talk to them. There's this guy that was saying, uh, he was praying and he said, oh, well, let me win the lottery. Oh, let me win the lottery. I want to win the lottery and so on. Poor God again. But, and so the big voice comes down and says, yeah, but you have to buy a ticket first. <laughs> so a lot of us, you know, poor me, I want to do this, want to do that. But what are you doing about it yourself is the question. And we teach responsibility in traditional healing. We teach people how to take responsibility for yourselves. The government, I was really happy, and if you haven't seen this book, I haven't read it, but there's one on the second floor where the trade show is uh, called, uh, this same kind of book, uh, uh, Aboriginal Food Guide. There's a, a nice, uh, thick book. I suggest you get it and look at it. What we did with our book is we, um, nobody knew what was inside our foods, you know? People say, well, go to have more protein, go have more fat, go have more whatever. Um, so we published a book that basically says, uh, this is what's in a walrus, this is what's in a caribou, this is in an octopus, this is in a fish, this is all these things, and these are your plants. And um, it's the first time we've ever done it. These things you have to do yourself. 
You cannot wait for someone else to do them. A lot of us have the attitude that, you know, the government will save us. The government will do this. And they won't do anything. And, they're, and you know, it's wonderful they gave you your responsibility for your health. But, you know, if you really think about it, they don't want it. <laughs> they're just happy to turn it over. Um, in fact, a lot of tribes are afraid of that because they're afraid of, uh, what is that word? Uh, like government wants to cut you off and, and say goodbye to their responsibilities. So you can do it, but you have to hold government to their responsibility and not disenfranchise you as native people from the tribes. And it's not a, a favor they're doing us. It's based on treaties. Uh, we tell people we prepaid our health insurance and our education with the treaties and all the things that went along with it. It's not a big favor. Trust me, nobody's doing favors for Native people. Um, <clears throat> so we have the Nuka Institute and all these kinds of things. But um, time is moving, and it's time to discuss some things. So Aaron and the helpers in the back have a microphone. And hopefully you'll ask something or say something or, you know, we're, we all share in the wisdom we bring. So thank you, everybody. Always hard to be the first. I'll keep talking if you don't. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have the awkward question of asking about funding. Currently, the majority of our contribution agreements are outlined with targeted programs. And I guess my question is, how, how do you fund your traditional healers? I noticed that you had about five or six employed within that area. And secondly, is there, do you have people and government that you have to report to on? on those traditional healers as we do here in BC. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, finding them is hard. Uh, we pray a lot. We depend on, we don't look for miracles. We depend on them. Finding a good traditional healer is a miracle, in my opinion. Uh, our criteria are that they have to be Alaska Native. Um, and it's amazing when you have a traditional healing clinic, the people that come to your door that want to be em employed. Non-native people, too. Uh, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm, I asked about funding. Yeah, I oh. will. I'll, oh, I'll okay. get there. But I just want to tell you that, that um, you have to find the right thing first, and money follows. If you follow the money, I guarantee you'll go crazy. Um, I have a woman that came to me and said, I'm a psychic, I want to work for you. I said, okay, and she wasn't native. I said, how would you become a psychic? Well, I went to Hawaii and took a course for six months. And I said, well, you know, if she was that good, she'd know that she wouldn't have a chance, but whatever. Because <laughs> she couldn't be that good. But... I believe that money follows good ideas. When I was a minister of health, you'd be surprised how many things I said no to because they would, it's a way for government or somebody to get their hooks into you and you could never get them out. People love programs. You can start programs all day, but when you have to close one or take one away, ouch. So traditional healing, I honestly believe if you begin to set it up, sources will come that you won't believe. We, um, so we're not taking federal funding because they have too many hooks along with it and they don't know what they're doing either. Um, how you find one is hard. It's usually on recommendation of people and we check, we go back to the village and we talk to people they've treated and we talk to people about their reputation and so on. Um, the danger that we see in Alaska, <clears throat> not in our clinic, but um, there are a lot of New Agers around. And it's a deep, deep danger because it's like people, like the Lakota people. The Lakota people are wonderful, but everybody copies their regalia. And they wonder, 
you know, people want the form but not the substance. People want the magic bullet inside the plant, like echinacea, as opposed to the things that go with it. When do you harvest a plant? What time? What prayers do you say? Do you use the root? Do you use the tips? Do you use the leaves? And they just want to drill down in a test tube what it is. But we tell them it's much more than that. It's, it's a spiritual experience. It's not just take this leaf and eat it. Um, and there are New Agers that know enough just to be dangerous. You know, they read books about, and people shouldn't be publishing these, but often they're, at least the ones I've seen are anthropologists. And um, they said, and these people come in this room and they sit around, they light a fire and they have a sweat and so on, but they're missing the whole spirituality of the thing. So the trick is you've got to find, if you're gonna start a traditional healing clinic, uh, there are two things that are critical. One, you have to find, obviously, the right tribal doctors. And we do not let tribal doctors do what they're trained to do all the time. Because uh, some of our tribal doctors were trained to bloodlet. You know, that won't go over very well in the hospital. Um, and other ones turn babies. It's just what they do. No, not in the hospital. So. We've come up with guidelines, and we're the first traditional healing program in the United States to be accredited by the Joint Commission on Hospitals. So that's like a miracle. Um, but the deal is that tribal doctors need to know the trade-off between their working as a tribal doctor uh, is, and getting paid for it, is um, that you, do what you're paid to do, and you don't get ahead of everybody else. So we don't practice shamanism. We don't practice some of the things that tribal doctors do. Um, what's the trade-off? Well, all of a sudden, uh, you have a doctor that's not paid in tobacco and, uh, and blanket, but they're paid on a salary, cash money. That's huge in the tribal world. And number two, we recognize them as a doctor. So we call our doctors together, our tribal doctors and our native doc uh, MDs and the psychologists, and everybody's a doctor. And they're recognized as a doctor, and they're certified by our Council of Elders. So in Hawaii, they said to me, how do you certify a doctor? Doesn't like a university have to do that? And I said, why? Who says we can't? And he said, Oh my God, I never thought of that. I said, a tribal council, why not? A council of elders comes together, and as they did in past ages, they just sit down and say, this is the way it is. So we just say, this is the way it is. And as long as they work for us, they're certified, and they're covered under federal tort, which means if they have a, some kind of an accident, somebody wants to sue them, uh, they're covered by the same license we have, which is incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I love that. And I have a question for you related to the certifying. Do you have challenges with tribes and families not agreeing? And how do you overcome that? Not or do you? Go, go, certifying, go a little further. Not certifying agreeing on the tribal doctor yeah so in our communities we have families tribes oh, clans sure, 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 sure. depending on where you come well, from and if they don't agree i think you have to realize that um that you will never please everybody when i was the minister of health we had huge fights over fluoride in the water half wanted fluoride half didn't my governor governor hickel would say I said, how are we going to please all these people? How are we going to do that? And he taught me. And he said, if Jesus came back, he would be nailed to the cross again. <laughs> and I've always carried that with me. Because you'll never make everybody happy. Actually, if you can just do the majority, that would be great. But sometimes, you know, that's where you have this incredible heart intuition. You have incredible tuition if people would stop suppressing it. 
well, everybody's doing something else, but my gut says I should do this. Follow the gut. You ask Crater for answers. There's no real tough answers. You know, the finger doesn't come down and say, choose this one. No, it's you follow your gut. And I've never made a mistake. The mistakes I've made in my life is when I override that and say, no, 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 I want this. I tell people, um, <clears throat> in fact, today I was talking to people, one of, when I have uh, console younger patients, um, they're always talking about women or men, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Wright. And I need a partner. I'm just graduated from medical school. I last time I went dating was when I was 18, you know. I, I want to have a baby. I want to do this. So blah, 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 blah. And I tell them to stop visualizing the answer. One of my other favorite sayings, we have a whole book of sayings here, um, is how do you make creator laugh? And the answer is tell them your plans. <laughs> so if you stop visualizing the answer, if you say a prayer, and don't predict the answer. Well, the prayer's answered if he has blonde hair and 6'1", and he's rich and whatever, whatever. Well, the thing is that, well, he might be 60 years old. He might be 20 years old. Uh, he might have a handicap. He might not. Um, one of the hardest things is to get that third eye back that children have where they just accept everybody. I think it comes back to you later in life. We tell people that your powers to heal, traditional healers teach me that uh, come back when you're around 50. And so we look for tribal doctors a little bit older um, that people gravitate to. Um, and we tell people stop predicting the outcome of your prayer. Let it happen. Have eyes that, new eyes that see. Uh, we teach there's no randomness in life. People come and talk to you for a reason. And people touch your life for a reason. Don't blow them off, you know. And even in Japan, many years ago, I read something in Japanese that said, even, they used to wear these long gowns with the big sleeves, and they said, even when your cloak or whatever it is, your sleeve, rubs against somebody in passing, you take some of their karma away. So there's no, life changes on a dime. It's amazing how things happen. That once you go out of this room, you're not gonna be the same person you came in. And I try to tell people things, not because I'm very smart, but I pray before I give a talk, and I don't read talks, but, uh, and I say, uh, creator, let me tell them what they need to hear. I remember a, a gathering of traditional healers and one of our most powerful tribal doctors was a very humble man, very humble. And he was sitting on the floor. And he's in his 90, he's about 90 now. And I said, Maynard, where do I find you if I need to find you? And he said, um, tribal doctors find you. When you need us, we show up. And so there was a Catholic priest at this meeting, and he wore his white robes. He was a Dominican and a young priest. And um, he uh, stood up before everybody and started reading his speech to us, um, to the tribal doctors. And so Maynard raised his hand, and he said, excuse me. And the priest was very upset. And he said, well, can't this wait till later? He said, no. And he said, OK, what's well, the emergency? And he said, well, can you please sit down? He said, all our life, people stand up and talk down to us. And you need to do that. So he sat down. So he started reading his paper again. And he raised his hand again. And he said, well, like, now what? Um, he said, will you stop reading from your paper? He said, will you talk from your heart? Because if you really believe it, it'll come from your heart, not from this paper. So later, I talked to my friend, who's the Archbishop of Anchorage, and, uh, and he laughed. And he said, that's probably the greatest lesson that guy ever learned. <laughs> so as Native people, we tell people, you don't go to a village in a suit. <laughs> you don't walk in and start reading a paper. You know, people want to see who you are. When we see a patient, we drill down. 
with every single patient. Who are you? Where are you from? Who's your parents? Who's your relatives? Because we know most people in all the villages. Who are your relatives? Where are you from? And then we find out if a person is urban or rural because urban people have a whole set of rules that are much different than rural. Who are you from? Where are you from? Uh, and we just start talking about what do you know about traditional healing. And we spend the first 15 minutes just doing history. Who are you? And this is who I am. And by the way, have some tea. And if we have some fish, have some fish. And people start crying very quickly. So the trick in traditional healing is to somehow teach people to walk. People get very dependent. People are searching. You know, look at Jim Jones leading all these people into the desert and all of them dying. People are just following people that are out there. And, and we try to get people not to be dependent on us. We try to get people connected back to their village. We try to get people so that they don't, de if they depend on us, we're a failure. So we tell people, you need to learn to walk for yourself. You're not happy, it's your fault. So how do you deal with administration? How do you know if people want, the questions most asked to me about starting a traditional healing clinic, one of the most sought after questions, I, I know this came from Australia, uh, the Australian Medical Association was saying to me, well, we wanna, we wanna start traditional healing, where do we start? What do we do? How do we license them? Where does it work? And my answer is that it has to come from the people and it has to come from your consul. And your consul, your tribal members have to want it or it won't work. They don't need another program sent to you by government. They need it because they want to learn something. They want to do something different because as I mentioned earlier today, what is the definition of insanity? And insanity is doing the same thing, the same way, and expecting a different outcome. So people are hungry for something new. They want something, if you're a consular, I strongly suggest if you're indigenous, uh, you, or he'll cook up with an indigenous consular. It's magic. It's absolutely magic. It just is unbelievable. Uh, we are training people to be behavioral health. We have health aides. I'm sure you have like health representatives or something in your communities. We have gone the second step, as you probably know, and hired and trained dental health aides. And uh, we found this program in New Zealand, brought it to Alaska. We were immediately sued by the American Dental Association. but. Um, million dollars later, uh, they lost. And, um, and the third uh, kind of group of people that we're uh, training are behavioral health aides. We are training people in villages to, uh, for people to go to. Because the reality is we have no roads, it takes a long time to get there, and what happens if there's a suicide? What happens if there's a murder? What happens if there's a drowning? What happens if there's a plane crash? Yes, we send a SWAT team out and they come and help and so on, but they leave after a day or two and then all you've got left is who's in the village. So we're training this new breed of cat now to um, <coughs> handle mental health problems in the community because the biggest problem in the world is mental health. Another, I think we have probably time for one more question. Erin, find somebody with, oh, okay. Erin's very good, she's uh, looking. That's it, that's it, tell them. Here, you know what you should do. Uh, Georgie, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Tell them about your work and tell them uh, your work with um, being the advocate for traditional healing and how to reach you. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> Um, so my name is Dr. Georgia Kaiba, and um, we actually have developed a traditional healers advisory committee with uh, the First Nation Health Authority, and they will be here tomorrow afternoon, or 11.05 to 11.45, and they're going to be talking about themselves and um, 
um, giving a little bio and then the work that they do in their communities. And this is the first step um, that we have, we've developed this committee in moving traditional healing forward in the communities. Um, the First Nation Health Authority has many traditional medicine initiatives and um, it's what communities are wanting. We've done a lot of engagement with communities. I myself am not a traditional healer. I'm a naturopathic physician and um, I've been trained as a naturopath naturopathic physician in Portland, Oregon. And I work with the First Nation Health Authority and I also still do see patients. I work in the community with Squamish First Nation and um, that's a little bit about me. That's a question. So Ted was asking, how do people find traditional healers? And that's a question that um, communities ask a lot. And that we are working with communities to um, develop a list. Um, but right now, it's really about connecting with the people in your community that might be doing healing. And really you know, making sure that anyone that's saying that they are a traditional healer, that they are coming from a community recommendation and that they're based in and around your area. Um, but, you know, right now, we don't necessarily provide a list of healers. Um, but if you are interested or wanting any more information, you can definitely contact me. And um, we do have a lot of resources, like Ted said, on our website. Um, I'm not sure if it has moved over. We've just probably, as a lot of you know, that our website has changed from the First Nation Health Council to the First Nation Health Authority. It is on the older website, which is still up. Um, so I'm not sure if that information has moved over yet. But you can always definitely contact me and I can give you that information. So thank you, and I hope you guys enjoyed the talk. Thank you. So I want to close and just thanking you again. I want to bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in the north. We're all one people. There's just imaginary political lines that divide us. The birds don't know that. The animals, the caribou don't know. It's humans that screw up the planet. Um, so know that we're next door. Know that we're all related. Um, and um, we're all in this together. Um, and all I want to do is share experiences with you that we know. Um, please I, um, feel free to contact me. And if you're really slick and you get to the back door before the front, there are a whole bunch of goodies back there. So thank you.